Hola. Hola. My name is Maria Montes, and I'm incredibly honored to be here and share my story with all of you. First of all, thanks to Dominique and George and the entire Taipison community for your ongoing support, because it means the world to me. My talk today, it's called Sketch Shitless. <laughs> And this is how I feel right now. Um, this is my first talk on a big stage, so I'm going to say, excuse me if I lose it at any point during the next 30 minutes. My talk, just to give you a heads up, is extremely personal. So this is a very personal journey, starting in my hometown and ending on this stage today. So let's do it. I was born in Blanes, a small town 70 kilometers north of Barcelona. My father used to work for a pharmaceutical company, and every Christmas this company organized a drawing competition for the employees' children to take part on. I loved drawing, so my father took me to the contest every year. He's super competitive, and I only ever won the second prize, so he wasn't that impressed about my excuse. At the age of six, I started figure rolling skating. I was training every second day, a total of 20 hours a week. I loved everything about skating, except the competition season. One day, I was going to compete, and my trainer was super tough on all of us. I remember going to compete and feeling sick, and to be honest, I don't know if I was really sick or just freaking out completely, but I was throwing up in the toilet while the MC was calling my name on the microphone. So I ran outside, performed my two minutes program, and went back to the toilet. That day, I also only made it second, and my trainer and my father was so impressed about that either. After that day, I started hating skating. After many, many years, I have realized that this competitiveness, I just only, I have applied that on my own. My goal is becoming a better version of myself as a human being as well as a designer. So paraphrasing Nicole Phillips here today is, please, be generous, share your knowledge, and you do not compete with your peers, but work in collaboration with them, as Eliza said before. At the age of 12, my parents were severely injured by a man who randomly threw a Molotov cocktail through my mom's car's window. I was just around the corner when it happened, and I saw my parents coming out of the car in flames. I was scared to death. Since that moment onwards, fear became a huge part of my life, and I have spent all these years fighting it and pushing through it. And I promise it gets happier. <laughs> my grandmother has been a huge influence in my life. She was a fashion designer and a dressmaker. With her assistance at the age of 16, I was cutting and sewing my own garments, and I loved it. So by the age of 18, I decided to enroll for a fashion design degree. I wasn't convinced you can make it as a fashion designer for some reason, so I decided that I would enroll for a graphic design degree at the same time, as everyone in this room knows that, of course, graphic designers make so much more money. <laughs> yep, such a clever thing. I spent that year drawing fashion silhouettes during the day and typesetting in Quark Express in page maker for the oldies here. So my first big fashion influence was Paco Rabanne. Paco Rabanne was born in Basque Country, and he fled from Spain to go with his mother to France with, when Franco won the war. Paco uses unconventional materials in his designs, such as metal, paper, and plastic. In 1995, Paco Rabanne released Excess. I remember discovering the perfumes packaging, and something about these letters caught my attention, and I couldn't stop looking at them. Actually, to be honest, I just looked at these letters after many, many years for the first time again putting this presentation together. And I thought to myself, how scary to see the resemblance between this design and my green fairy font that you're going to see shortly. At the end of that year, I decided to specialize only on graphic design, as I would have the opportunity of learning more about typography. I learned calligraphy for the first time in 1996. Calligraphy was a compulsory subject, part of my BA in graphic design. I learned about ductus, contrast, rhythm, and composition through the art of writing. 
In that time, calligraphy wasn't a trend at all, more of the opposite. The Apple Macintosh was kicking hard in the market, and everyone knew that the computer was the way to go. So writing calligraphy didn't make a lot of sense for many people. Five years later, in, uh, I graduated in 2000, and five years later, I found myself working at a graphic design studio in Barcelona with two Germans, one French, and one Italian designers. They all spoke their mother languages, plus English, Spanish, and they all understood Catalan. I felt really weak. As I realized I was living in a comfort zone and not challenging myself enough, I was also ashamed because I couldn't speak English either. So it took me 29 years of my life to find the courage to pack my bag and book a one-way ticket overseas. I was so scared of feeling homesick and running back home at the first chance that I flew to the furthest destination possible, <laughs> as it would cost me an arm and a leg to book my flight back home. <laughs> the 28 hours flight from Barcelona to Brisbane was the scariest thing I've ever done in my life. My first memories of Australia are incredible blue skies and big embarrassments. On the first day in the country, I only had to accomplish two targets. Do not get lost, have a coffee. I was successful at the first one, so I felt very confident about the second one. At the English school where I enrolled, I asked for different types of coffee in Australia and what they meant. I only had to memorize one thing, Small, flat white, thanks. <laughs> uh, so I walked to the coffee shop. There was a huge line out of people ordering for takeaways. So the longer I stood in line, the more nervous I became. And then finally my turn arrived, and I said confidently to the bartender, small flat mate, thanks. <laughs> and this is true, I'm not shitting you. <laughs> The bartender was so nice because I was, he was very nice, all right? He was looking at me with big open eyes, shook his head, and I was like, what? What? Okay, my accent is rubbish, but surely you got what I said, right? And then I was like, wait, what? Is this a coffee shop? <laughs> I was so confused. And then a few seconds later, I realized what I said. And for the next three years, I only ordered lattes, although. <laughs> Although I hate lattice foam. <laughs> Living out of my comfort zone was hard. Being away from friends and family and learning a new language at the age of 29 years old was a big challenge, but a lot of good things came along the way. Three months after landing in Brisbane, I secured a company to sponsor me as their lead graphic designer. For the ones in this room that are dealing with Australian visas, believe me, I know how it is. I know the pain, the money, and the stress that you are going through. In 2006, Spanish people didn't have a working holiday visa agreement with Australia. So for me, being sponsored by a company or being a student was my only chance to live and work in this country. My three years sponsored in Brisbane were not easy. I felt alone most of the times, and I wasn't proud of my work at all. I didn't know how to reach the gap between where I was and where I wanted to be. After 11 years working as a full-time graphic designer, I decided to upgrade my knowledge. For me, I considered typography the main tool for a graphic designer. So in 2011, I went back to Barcelona for six months to study a postgraduate course in advanced typography. The course gave me the opportunity of developing my first unfinished typeface design. Thank you. <laughs> Call me wash italic. After the course finished, I moved to Melbourne for the first time, planning on specializing in typography. But very different things were awaiting for me around the corner. A fashion designer friend of mine from Barcelona got in touch and offered me to collaborate on a project about textile prints. I didn't know anything about textile design, and I hadn't drawn organic forms in ages. I don't know, I was really scared of starting something completely new, but I didn't have a job, and she encouraged me very much, and I said yes. 
I was new in Melbourne, and I set up my desk inside my bedroom. During our first months together, we had really, really good results. And she offered me to collaborate, to be part of a collaborative partnership, all together with a company in Asia, who would produce, deliver our textiles, and also would pay for our work. Working from home in solitude, while figuring out independently how to become a professional textile designer was one of the toughest things I've done in my career. Six months into my textile design journey, I couldn't stop thinking about typography, of course. So I decided to enroll this time for a six weeks typeface design condensed program at Cooper Union in New York City. Being admitted to type at Cooper was a great learning curve professionally and personally. Tap at Cooper gave me the motivation to go back to my broad nibs and pointed pens and write calligraphy as a daily exercise. And this actually gave me a huge advantage because during that course, we had to develop our own humanistic typeface based on our own calligraphy. So we spent a couple of days writing, then we selected our best letters, cut them, scanned them, and started to redraw and reinterpret our own letters at seven centimeters X high, as you can see there. We used tracing paper to reinterpret and redraw everything. And the, this hand lettering process was about two weeks. So during two weeks, we were refining and refining the letter forms in bigger size, till the drawings were very, very defined. Then the vectorization arrived using RoboFont to FontLab, and I felt that because the hand drawings were so defined, the vectorization process was very straightforward. This course gave me the opportunity of developing my second unfinished typeface design <laughs> called March 22. Unfinished does not mean unused. I use my font every opportunity I have. And of course, no one knows. And of course, no one asks, wow, man, which font did you use? But in my head, I'm like, yep, yeah, this is my baby. Fuck yeah. And I'm really happy. <laughs> when we talk about lettering, as almost most of you know, we talk about the art of drawing letters. And this can be done by hand or by computer. This one in here is my first lettering piece ever designed in 2013 and inspired by the work of Gemma O'Brien. I decided to use the same process as I had learned at Type at Cooper with Jean-Francois Poches. So I started with my own calligraphy and a rolling pen. As you see, the calligraphic sketch doesn't have to be amazing at all. But is enough the foundation. This one even has a spelling mistake, as I'm mixing Catalan and English on the word typography. You don't need to be a calligrapher to be able to draw letters. But Understanding the structure, where the thin and thick are and why, is going to help you a lot in your design process. Once I was happy with the calligraphic sketch, I scanned, printed in an A3 size, and used my own grids and tracing paper again, and I started redrawing, adding weight, and adding contrast. Once I felt that the hand lettering sketch was close enough, then I scanned again the original in the computer and I redrew everything, this time in Illustrator. I remember looking at this piece and thinking, with this piece I really wanted to explore the visual possibilities of creating a vector lettering piece, but with a very strong hand-drawn feeling. When I finished, I remember looking at this piece and feeling very proud of my work for the first time. I told myself, I'm now one step closer. Two years into my textile design journey, I was illustrating all day, every day. I was using the same process as I had used in my lettering piece. So I was drawing by hand every element individually using tracing paper. Then I, I was scanning every element and coloring with Photoshop, and then using Illustrator for the final layout. By that time, we were doing very well. We were so busy, I had to stop all my graphic design work to only focus on textiles. We were designing for very big international fashion houses, and our scarves were sold around the world. 
In January 2014, I received an email from the Mongolian company we were collaborating with telling me that they no longer needed my services and wishing me a happy Chinese New Year. <laughs> and that was shit house. <laughs> all of a sudden, I lost all my clients and I had no money coming in at all. I panicked. My first reaction was very quickly pumping up my folio and looking for a full-time job straight away. But my partner told me, please, Maria, take some time to think about what you want. And so I did. I took six months off to reflect and only generate personal work. And this is the first time in my career I'm only generating personal work. My partner was paying for our house expenses, and I was living out of my savings, only spending $600 a month, which included food and my very affordable desk space in Melbourne. For me, moving from home to a co-working space, as Eliza said before, was instrumental. Maggie Johnson was a huge co-working space with over 40 designers. This gave me the opportunity of meeting really, really good designers that have now become very good friends, networking, and getting massively inspired. To be honest, at the beginning, it wasn't easy because I was following the same schedule as I had previously, so about 10 hours a day, and I was writing calligraphy as a daily exercise again. I was a bit like, I'm working so much and I'm not getting paid a cent any day. But at the same time, I really enjoy, like I get used to the idea of knowing that I was not gonna get paid for it, and I actually started to enjoy the fact that no one was telling me what to do or how to do it. Some of the designers at Magic Johnson that were looking at me, and some of them came and were like, what are you doing? And I'm like, what do you mean? I'm writing. And some of them answered, can you teach me? I had never taught before, and all my calligraphy lingo was in Catalan. I didn't even know how to start, but I told myself, it's time to start new things again. So with the help of my very good friend, Lauren Villitati, I put together my first calligraphy workshop in Melbourne at the amazing rate of $20 for four hours tuition. <laughs> my first class was the scariest thing I did in a long time. I thought I was going to faint like today. But I did survive, and I learned a lot of new things. Most of my friends, like Carla, came to my first classes, and they all encouraged me to keep going. In those times of uncertainty, I asked for advice to as many people as I could, and that's when I met Bobby. Bobby High Culture was very, very generous with me. I remember emailing him and asking him for advice, and he was generous to coming to my studio to see me. I was showing him my textile design and lettering work, and we talked about mixing them both. And that's how my first cocktail artwork was born. The piece took over a month. I drew every ingredient individually, again with tracing paper. I scan everything, and I color everything inside the computer. And then, as with my textile design process, I was using Illustrator for the layout. Of course, I had to now add lettering into the cocktail. So I went back and used again a rolling pen and my own calligraphy. And I sketched the sentence, a bloody Mary a day keeps the doctor away. I like vodka. Um, <laughs> when I was happy with the calligraphic sketch, I scanned in a bigger size, in an A4, and I used tracing paper again. Every tracing paper here worked as an analog layer where I'm adding or removing weight, maybe changing letter shapes or maybe modifying letter spacing. Once I felt that the hand lettering was close and defined enough, again, I scanned the original in the computer and I redrew everything with Illustrator again. The process was extremely long, but once the piece was finished, I was very, very happy with it. My Bloody Mary artwork was part of a group exhibition in Melbourne called Supergraph, where I actually sold my first big frame artwork ever. Two months later, three more copies of this Bloody Mary flew to London to be part of Pick Me Up Arthur, and I sold the three pieces. At that time, I was in Barcelona. I was really happy. And some of my friends actually asked me, are you going to do a gin and tonic piece? As gin and tonics are the dream by excellence in Barcelona in recent years. So I did, 
and more good shit happened. <laughs> this time, uh, all the ingredients of the gin and tonic were drawn directly in Illustrator, but the lettering followed the same process again. So I started with my calligraphy, followed by hand lettering, and finalizing with vector lettering. Once the piece was finished, I was really proud of it. And I saw three copies straight away. And I again had this feeling in my guts. I thought, I am now two steps closer. And then something really good happened. A cocktail venue in Melbourne called New Amsterdam emailed me and offered me their space for a solo exhibition. And I was in my head, this is the best shit ever. <laughs> I was so happy. I decided to focus the next six months on a series of illustrated cocktail artworks that you are going to see now. This one was my cocktail number three. It's called Old Passion and it's featuring an old fashioned drink. The lettering is inspired by a song of Freddie Mercury. This one, it's called The Stimulant and is inspired by uh, the origins of the English espresso martini drink. This one is a Mexican margarita, and the words that says, my heart belongs to, that's my first unfinished typeface, <laughs> just that you know. <laughs> the piece is inspired by New Amsterdam's cocktail menu with a pineapple twist. The next one is an Italian chili chocolate Negroni, and the artwork is using the colors of the Italian flag. And if you are wondering, I'm sure you are, the word time is said with my second unfinished typeface design. <laughs> so now you know. The next one is a French absence, and I will talk a bit more about this in a couple of minutes. And the next one is a Cuban strawberry mojito. Now, four of these artworks also made it into beautiful letterpress prints thanks to the amazing skills of Amy from San Gertrude. I love them. My exhibition opening day was a huge celebration of fighting fear and over overcoming obstacles, but right after my exhibition, things started to change in my mind. I don't know if you are familiarized with this term, but I wasn't, and I wish I was. The image I'm going to show you now, I am shitting my pants, I shit you not, this is inspired by my feelings right after my solo exhibition. Having a six-month project in mind with a specific deadline made me extremely focused and motivated. But once the exhibition was over, I started to feel really lost. I started to ask myself way too many questions like, what's next? Where am I going now? What am I doing? Most importantly, when am I going to get paid again? I was really, really scared. I started 2016 feeling extremely tired. I wasn't motivated at all, and I let myself go into a mental black hole. I had no positive thoughts coming to my mind at all, and one day I sketched this. Shit will hit the fan, as if it was a premonition of the amount of shit that was just about to come. In a couple of days, I sketched another one, and then another one. And then I started to get text messages from friends of mine telling me, I love your shit series. <laughs> and I'm like, what? <laughs> My shit series? Is it a series? Then I was like, oh, okay, yeah, I get it. Yeah, okay. And then I was like, yep, <laughs> oh yeah, that's going to be serious. So I kept going. No particular style, no deadlines, just keep going. As the project was grabbing attention, I was slowly gaining momentum and slowly getting out of my black, mental black hole. By October last year, I started to feel better for the first time. People were asking me, so what's next now? Are you gonna do a fuck series? <laughs> and I was like, I am just starting to feel alive again in my mind. The project has been growing organically creating a post whenever I feel like it, and using calligraphy, hand lettering, or vector lettering, randomly. My sheet series have made me realize the importance of being creatively fit. A commercial client 
can easily ask you to deliver a job in two days, sometimes less than that. Being able to deliver a job in such a tight deadline is like running a marathon of 48 hours. Unless you're not training daily and keeping your body in a good shape, you won't make it. My cheat series have been part of my ongoing routine for over 18 months now. Being able to stop commercial work, to squeeze into hours of personal work, have made me definitely creatively fitter and have freshened up things for me. So I recommend it to everyone. Up to today, I have created 91 posts and I have also decided to stop at 100. And something good happened as well. Something amazing happened this year. After holding a student visa, a 457 a sponsorship visa, a de facto visa, and a permanent residency for the last 10 years, me, myself, and I became Australian. And I was on top of the moon. A few days later, I turned 40, and I thought this was the best present ever. Releasing commercially a fund has been a to-do list on my mind for a long time, since I first got in touch with typeface design, basically. In the past, I have, uh, I have tried to finish my first typeface design without succeeding. I have also tried to finish my second typeface design, but the, fa the task felt really daunting, and I didn't have the guts to do it. So I guess I was scared of failing and disappointing myself for the third time. But then I, th I thought of this man. This man is called W. A. Dwiggins, and he is my all-time inspiration. He was a prolific American book designer, calligrapher, and typeface designer. Also, he released his first commercial typeface in his 40s. So I told myself, no, nah, I am not too old for this shit. Yeah. So, as you've seen in the past, I designed a cocktail artwork featuring an absinthe. Something about the absinthe lettering got, my, got stuck in my head. And a year later, I opened Illustrator, and I decided to redraw the 26 letters of the uppercase alphabet. This year, I was very fortunate, because I started 2017 having my two calligraphy uh, courses sold out. So I took this amazing opportunity to devote myself to my baby for a few months. My baby is called Green Fairy. I thought to myself, you know, this time is going to be easy. It's only an uppercase design, after all. And then, shit. <laughs> I was so wrong. Green Fairy started being one weight, but quickly turned into a chromatic font. As you've seen before with Clint and his presentation, he was talking about chromatic boot blocks. That would be the same thing as chromatic digital blocks, as every layer stacks on top of each other being a font and adding color. I was doing more or less okay till I arrived to the dots white. I started drawing squares following a grid. Then the squares turned into diamonds, also following their grid, and this time touching the outskirts of the letter. Then I felt that this grid wasn't going to work very well with the curvy letters, so I decided to try randomizing the position of the diamonds and see if it worked, but it didn't. So I have to go back to the grid, and this time I'm scaling down the size of the diamonds to create a visual halftone effect. It took me over four weeks only working on the dots. I felt like I was going in a very long, dark tunnel, and I couldn't see the light. But by the start of June, I was like, yeah, I fell back on track. So I kept redrawing, readjusting, retweaking, spacing, redrawing, readjusting. And then the diacritics came on board. And more redrawing, readjusting, retweaking, spacing, and then the numbers. And more redrawing, and then kerning, and symbols, 
and currencies. So, this month of September, I told myself, that's it. I am going to finish this now. But guess what? Redrawing, retweaking, readjusting, kerning, hinting, contextual triplets. I would love to tell you that my green fairy is finalized and available on the market, but it is not ready yet. Although I'm very close. Although I've said that many times as well. <laughs> but I am very close this time. I am very close. And I promise you that I'm not going to stop till I finish it. I promise you that. And you will know about that as well. For the ones in this room not familiarized with typeface design, it is extremely time consuming and it requires a lot of hard work and determination. This project could have never been possible without the help of these amazing people that I want to shout out here. Jose Mauros is my mentor on this project and twice my teacher in the past. Jamie Clark is a freelance lettering and typeface designer who's developed a couple of chromatic fonts as well. Troy Leinster is a full-time uh, typeface designer from Australia, currently living in New York City. Noe Blanco is a freelance typeface designer and hinting specialist living in Catalonia. And Nicole Phillips, who's in this room here, typographer and currently moving from Australia to New Zealand. Thank you very much. So, nowadays, what happens? Um, my commercial practice sits between three main categories. The first one is commission work. This is my studio, Rodson Studios. I have been there over two years now, sharing my space with, over, with about 16 designers, photographers, videographers, and entrepreneurs. And I feel extremely lucky to share my desk and my time with people that respect and support my work. And I recommend it to all of you. This one, uh, I also do illustration commissions in a bigger and a smaller scale. And I keep my textile design practice going. But this time, I collaborate with the small independent fashion labels where I feel more like an aligned vision and we have a more humanized relationship. My second big category of work is self-generated work. And this is a huge part of my, my practice. My partner, collects the skateboards. We have over 48 skateboards hanging off one of the walls in our house. Every now and then I become a better girlfriend by designing skateboards for our anniversaries, and he loves it. <laughs> this one in here is a wedding gift for my very good friends Lauren and Felipe. And this one is what I called rebranding yourself and the pain that goes with it. And if you have ever tried to do that, you will know what I'm talking about. The last part of my professional practice is education. I love being a teacher as much as being a student. So every year, I go back to Europe and study with my old-time calligraphy teachers, Keith and Amanda Adams. Being on the student's side of the room makes me definitely a better instructor, and I love being there, and I love being a student. For the last four years, I have been teaching calligraphy workshops in Australia, and I'm really enjoying the experience. So what now? What now? Well, as you've seen, my journey is not really a straight line. There are some successes, there are some step backs. There are some days when you feel that you are winning, and there are other days when you feel that you are losing all your confidence. Maybe some of you in this room have been through very similar stages, and I would love to hear all your stories as well. As for me, I am still scared of what's coming, but I am determined, and I am not giving up. So do not give up, guys. Thank you very much.